Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Kendall Dunson and I are, are pleased to be here as, as we talk about the process of trying a lawsuit during COVID. Uh, I do want to encourage you to check out the events page at BeasleyAllen.com. We're planning on doing a webinar uh, the third Wednesday of every month. And of course, these are free CLE, and I encourage you to do that. I know that at the end of 2021, I was watching a lot of videos online to get mine, and I wish I had done it slowly over time. So I encourage you uh, every third Wednesday, uh, we'll have a seminar up. Uh, next time, we're, next time, in fact, Kendall, you were going to talk a little bit about, I think you and Evan are going to talk a little bit about um, how to turn a workers' compensation case into a product liability case. And so we'll talk about that. But, but this week, we certainly want to talk about um, trying a case during, during COVID. Um, Kendall and I had an opportunity to, to try a case um, during COVID, during, really during the, during the height of COVID. Um, a, lot, some, a lot has changed and a lot of things we need to talk about in terms of juror perceptions and those types of things. Um, but, but it's important, I do think it's important for us uh, as lawyers to make sure that our jury system is functioning uh, and that it's functioning well, uh, both for criminal trials and for civil trials, uh, even during a pandemic like COVID, our, our civil justice system and our criminal justice system are vital to our, to our society, to our country. And so um, we, we've always been advocates. We know that, that we've certainly been presented with a lot of obstacles um, that we're going to talk about today. And, and we'll talk about ways potentially that we can, we can um, overcome some of those particular obstacles. Let me start out by saying uh, the case that, that Kendall and I are going to talk about involves a case that we tried uh, Graham Asdell was involved in our case as well, but we, it was a case we, a dram shop case that we tried in Mobile in front of Judge Pipes. And, um, you know, I need to get my Judge Brownie points in, but, but, I, but I mean this sincerely. Judge Pipes uh, did an amazing, amazing job uh, during COVID and, and making the jurors feel comfortable. Um, he, he, he was, his, his attitude, uh, his perspective uh, was, was really what was needed during that time. And I, I thought he was, he was fantastic. But, but let me tell you, let, let me and let Kendall tell you a little bit about our case so that y'all will understand it as we get in and we speak a little bit more about our experience of trying a case during COVID. And then really some additional lessons that we've learned even since uh, our trial uh, during COVID. So Kendall, tell us a little bit about our lawsuit that we tried. Uh, our lawsuit, as Cole said, was a, a dram shop case against a dog track down in Mobile. Uh, one of the issues that we discussed before we went to trial was whether or not uh, we thought it was in our client's best interest to go to trial. Uh, a dram shop case obviously is a case that we felt like, uh, given the evidence in the case, it really didn't matter to us which, which jurors that, that we received because mm -hmm. it's, it's such a, uh, a a case that everybody can coalesce around. Nobody likes drunk driving. Uh, and, and so that was very mm -hmm. influential in us deciding it was appropriate and in our client's best interest to proceed to trial. But in a nutshell, uh, the person was overserved at the dog track. He left the dog track, was speeding going 100 miles an hour, ran to the back of our client. Uh, our client was in the car. He was a mother, a, a father, and a child. And unfortunately, the father was killed in that collision. So that's the, uh, the facts of that particular case. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting as you, as you talk about the fact that, that the jurors in that particular case, it, the backgrounds were not important. We would have taken really any of the 12. Uh, our jury foreman ended up being one of the top business leaders in Mobile, and um, so so that was interesting. When when we when we got there um, again, COVID was was raging, and and there was a lot that was unknown. 
Um, talk to, to us a little bit, Kendall, about our preparation in terms of how we were going to address COVID or that we weren't going to address mm -hmm. COVID particularly and, and the types of type of equipment that we use. This was a trial that was important enough that, that we hired a trial consultant to help us prepare for trial. And during that process, he advised and we agreed that we should not ignore COVID, but don't emphasize COVID. Uh, as a matter of fact, he basically said, you know, uh, the jury system must proceed. Uh, these people showed up for jury selection. Therefore, they understood or under, will understand the issues. So don't talk about COVID. Uh, just proceed uh, as if this is a normal trial, although it wasn't because we picked a jury in the jury assembly room, which is a very large room. Uh, the uh, bailiffs made sure everybody understood to wear their mask or their shield. Uh, everybody was separated uh, by a few chairs. Nobody was sitting next to each other. Uh, the attorneys had on masks and or shields. Everybody in the courtroom were following proper protocol. So you didn't need to talk about COVID. Uh, it was obvious that this was a situation we were trying to case during COVID. So we decided to basically push forward, uh, present our client's case and not talk about COVID. Yeah, and I would say this, we, we purposely decided to use those lovely face shields um, in, in our, when we were speaking. And usually when we weren't speaking, we, we put on the masks themselves Correct. just because we want, we, you know, certainly we cared about our neighbor and we wanted the jurors to understand that we cared about them as well. Now, you know, I was in court this week um, in, in a courtroom and the judge specifically said, look, when you're speaking, I don't want your mask on. Um, so I don't know if going forward that what, what judges, and I suspect that it's gonna be um, courtroom to courtroom, but, but in that particular courtroom in this particular week, and of course, COVID is, is raging again right now, and hopefully we're on the downward trend of it. Um, I, I read this morning, as a matter of fact, that Pfizer's CEO um, said in the paper that he believes we'll soon be able to return to a normal life due to the vaccines and the tests. But the reality is, uh, how long will that attitude take to present itself in, even assuming that's true, and I don't know if it is, but how long will that take that, that attitude to envelop uh, our culture and then even to envelop our court system as well? Uh, I think that it's, it's going to probably, even assuming things got back to normal, you're still looking at a three-year period at least that we're going to have to deal with that. No doubt, no doubt. And, and every courtroom is going to be different. Uh, as we'll show you later in, in this particular case, uh, that courtroom was set up such that the jury did not sit in the jury box. They sat in the gallery of the courtroom. Uh, I was in Gwinnett County for a summary judgment hearing a few weeks ago, and I noticed that their jury box had each juror seat separated by plexiglass. So they could still sit in the jury box, however, they were next to each other. So Although you have a partition separating you from, a, from the next juror, you may feel uncomfortable sitting next to someone uh, uh, during COVID. So every courtroom is gonna be different. Every judge's uh, decision about whether or not you wear a mask or wear a shield is gonna be different. Just be prepared to adapt to the, to the environment that you're in. Yeah, and I think that's probably one of the biggest lessons that we learned during this trial is flexibility, um, to, to be flexible throughout the trial because something's going to come up. And that's probably true in every trial, but certainly during COVID. Let me stop here just for a second and um, let you know that, that if you have any questions while Kendall and I are talking, feel free to type those out. Is that how they do that? Yeah. So type those out and we'll, we'll be able to see those questions. And at the appropriate time, we'll, we'll certainly do our best to answer any questions that you have. I don't think anybody else sees the questions that you're submitting, but feel free to uh, submit those questions. Kendall and I will probably have some time at the end to also answer questions that'll be more specific. But but just wanted to let you know, feel free to ask questions even, even while we're speaking. Um, Kendall, what would you say um, 
was your experience like during the COVID trial? I think one of the things I, I, I remember is the difficulty, or at least my difficulty, with trying a case and not being able to see the juror's reaction to certain evidence or to certain witnesses. Uh, the way that particular courtroom was set up, the jury sat in the gallery. And so some jurors you could not see at all. They were so far back in the courtroom and blocked by other jurors. Add to that the fact that they were wearing their masks uh, or shields and we could not see any facial expressions. Uh, finally, when we had a witness on the stand, our back was turned to the jury. I found that very difficult uh, because you know, you're used to watching the jury as evidence comes in as a, a, a juror or a witness gives an answer to a question that you, you know is important, you look to see your juror's reaction to the evidence or, or the answer. And during that trial, that was next to impossible to accomplish. So that's what I remember about that about that trial more so than anything else. Yeah, it may be good for you to show, um, show them the pictures of our particular courtroom. Okay, so, so as you can see here, we're seeing uh, the far left photograph, uh, the numbers on the benches uh, are where the jurors had to sit. Uh, you also see a, a television uh, screen to the left. There's also one to the right that you can't see. The jurors were so far from the witness that we had to have a closed circuit television in the uh, witness seat so the jurors could have a close up of the witness. Yeah, let uh, me stop you real mm -hmm. quick. Uh, in, in our particular case, and, and someone had asked a question about, about um, witnesses, in our particular case, the witnesses were behind a plexiglass, which is in, um, I guess that's number four? Correct. Okay, uh, in picture number four there. And so the judge uh, did not have the witnesses wear a, a face mask unless they insisted on wearing a face mask. Uh, the, the judge just had them speak uh, with their mouth open. But as Kendall said, unfortunately, the jury was so far away from the witnesses that that TV that's noted in in that first picture, uh, which was rather large, um, the the juror the juror was shown on that TV uh, to the jury itself. Yes, yeah. yes, and, and you know normally uh, in trials you may have many exhibits or just a few that when you publish you will actually hand that exhibit to the jury uh, a photograph or whatever. In this particular case, that did not happen at all. Uh, every exhibit uh, was shown on a screen that I do not see in the photographs. We had a large screen set up uh, to where any exhibit photograph or document was pulled up on that screen for the jurors to see uh, from the gallery. So uh, this was a paperless, basically a paperless trial uh, from the standpoint of the evidence that, that the, juror, the jury saw. Yeah, and I would say, look, at the end of the day, um, the key for lawyers, right, is to communicate and to communicate well. And some of that is certainly verbal in terms of the way that you communicate. But the hardest part, and Kendall alluded to it earlier, was the, the nonverbal communication. So typically in, in most trials, we have the jury in the jury box. We're sitting at the front table. And, you know, occasionally we're we're getting verbal cues, of course, from a jury in terms of evidence and uh, what's coming in and what's not coming in and getting sort of reactions. Well, because they were behind us uh, and our backs were to the jury for most of the trial, we really, while we thought the evidence was coming in fantastic, um, we really didn't know how the jury was taking that particular evidence. And, and that really created issues once the once the jury was out because in our particular case if you'll remember the jury came back uh with a question and the question for us was the way that we interpret it was not overly favorable to to our position um and so we freaked out just a little bit uh in terms of in terms of that going oh my goodness they didn't understand the evidence they didn't get this they didn't get that and of course we i think if we had been able to see them all during you know, during that week, or it took a little more than a week, during that, during those days of trial, 
uh, I think we wouldn't have been as freaked out about it had we been able yeah, to see them. I agree. Because, you know, you try a week long trial by the second or third day, you know, you recognize certain jurors, especially if they sit in the same seat. Uh, but for this trial, that that never became the case. Uh, you know, uh, luckily for us, the judge had uh, a special restroom for the jury to go to and then a different restroom for us. You know, generally you try a case, the jurors and attorneys may go into the same restroom, but you know that's, that's a juror, stay away. But if you don't recognize a person, you don't, you don't know uh, even to, to, to stay away. Uh, so luckily for us, during this trial, it was the only trial, I believe, on that particular floor. So we had the benefit of being able to, uh, the jury could use a, 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 an adjacent courtroom for their jury room. And they also had the opportunity to use a different restroom than what we would use. So that actually helped uh, in that we were the only trial going on that floor in Mobile County during that particular week. I know that you spoke to the jurors after after the trial. What did they say about that about that question that they were asking? Well, it, the the funny thing is uh, that was a, a simple question that one juror had that was not really relevant uh, to anything they were doing. But they wanted that, that one juror to be okay with where they were going, which was obviously uh, towards a very nice verdict for our client. Uh, and and uh, we actually, I don't know if you remember this, Cole, but there was a second question that came out later. Well, there was a request uh, for, um, what do you call it, a, a, a tablet or something so they could, you know, they could calculate or, or add up numbers. And we thought that was very positive. <laughs> but that was later on in the process. Well, you know, we had that first question. We were nervous because we didn't know what to do. As you can imagine, in a trial like that, there are always settlement negotiations going on. So the ability to interpret the jury's reaction to evidence and to interpret how the jury is accepting evidence is important to allow you to know how to negotiate or settle a claim if that's on the table for you and your client. During, and I know you've got some trials coming up, um, but during a, a trial during COVID, what advice would you give in terms of the the com communication with the judge, communication with the jury and communication with a witness, what kind of advice would you give in terms of uh, the best way to do that, um, whether you're wearing a mask or wear wearing other protective, protective gear? I think it's important to, to wear your mask or your shield. And if you decide that you need to take it off to be able to effectively communicate, make sure the judge uh, announces that it's okay for you to do so. You would not want uh, to take your mask or your shield off and have a juror or jurors believe that you're in violation of the court's order, or more importantly, they don't think you respect their right to safety. Uh, so do your best to, to be as normal as possible, but make sure you, you respect the courtroom order and you respect the juror's right to be safe. Some jurors may not think it's important, but one or two jurors may think it's extremely important for you to follow the rules. Yeah, and, and I'd say this, and mo most judges are really good at this anyway. They they have the rules in their courtroom and uh, they, they're gonna let you know what those rules are. And I just think that it's important if, if for whatever reason a, a judge forgets to let the jury know that you, that you ask the judge to say, please let the jury know this is what the rules are in your courtroom as it relates to COVID and uh, putting people at ease just because right. I want to, we want to make sure that we abide and follow those particular rules. And like you said, just pipes did a great job. He didn't make one announcement every time, you know, maybe once a day or maybe twice a day, he would announce, you know, this is what we're doing. Uh, this is to make sure we're going to be safe. He would also remind the jurors to make sure you keep your shield and all your mask on. Uh, so it was, uh, just Pice did a great job of relaying uh, what he wanted to happen in his courtroom during that trial. Yeah, I agree. Let's talk a little bit about witnesses um, and how we how we examined witnesses. Um, let's talk about live witnesses first, mm -hmm. and then and then we had a particular situation we yes. had to deal with. Um, when, when you're dealing with with live witnesses, and in this, in our particular trial, you had the jurors in the back of the room. Um, 
how would how would how did you do a good job of making sure that your witness uh, was engaging to the jury? I think that was something we were concerned about, obviously, because the witness is so far away uh, and you didn't have that opportunity to, to hand the witness a document like you would normally do. Uh, so we always had to refer to the to the screen that was up and, and we made sure our tech person always highlighted uh, the language in the document we thought was important. If it was a photograph, we made sure we blew up the part of the photograph we thought was important. And you want to make sure that you engage that witness uh, uh, to make sure he or she is doing what they should be doing. If it's your witness, obviously, you want to make sure you ask the right questions. I think it's easier to do so when it's an adverse witness because the jury knows that, okay, uh, this lawyer and this witness are on different sides. And I think on cross-examination, for whatever reason, jurors perk up or pay more attention because they know this is an important part of the case. It's when the witness is on, on direct that it could be kind of mundane or gets boring. You want to make, you want to get to the big point. You don't want to waste a lot of time on small stuff if you can avoid it because you want to make sure the jury is engaged in your trial and in the evidence as it comes in. Right. So the unique experience we had in our case was on the eve of, of trial, one of the experts um, that were a plaintiff's expert um, was exposed to someone with COVID and, and under the rules of the court, under the rules of CDC, um, they had to quarantine. And so the question was, well, what are we, what are we going to do? So we notified the court, the defense counsel actually asked for the trial to be continued because he, he believed um, that he needed to be able to cross-examine him in person as opposed to um, as opposed to doing it by video. Um, talk to us a little bit about how that went down. That was a, a, a difficult proposition. Uh, now uh, that I've used Zoom a hundred times, uh, I'm more experienced in not just talking on Zoom, but actually pulling up documents and sharing the screen. At that time, I was not adequately prepared, so I had to have a crash course uh, with our IT people on the on the spot to show me, you know, this is what you do to pull up a document. This is how you navigate the document. This is how you move around, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, having our tech people there to prepare me uh, to do that was extremely important uh, because everything had to be done uh, from my laptop that was on the podium uh, as I questioned that witness via Zoom. The issue defense counsel had was he wanted to be able to cross-examine the witness but not show the witness whatever documents he was going to use during that cross-examination. We solved that problem by uh, once I finished my direct of the witness, he used his thumb drive into the same laptop I was using to pull up any documents he wanted to use so that the witness would not have the advantage of knowing what the documents would be before the attorney started his cross-examination. Zoom worked extremely well. Everything went very smoothly. Uh, and I'm glad Judge Pike uh, allowed us to use Zoom to present that witness. Yeah, and, and he, had, he relied on some opinions that had been issued during COVID from the Alabama Supreme Court um, to make that to make that determination. And honestly, it, it went off without a hitch. It did. Really, I mean, I, he was, I thought direct examination couldn't have gone really any smoother and uh, defense counsel was able to, to um, ask effective questions. Now I'll say this, what do you, what do you think of, I, I've been reading about Zoom trials during COVID, what do you think about that? A whole trial view of Zoom? Yeah. I would not like that. No, I wouldn't uh, like it either. I would not like that. <laughs> I wouldn't like it either. I think we can do one or two witnesses. Right, right. Yeah, the, the, the jury, in my opinion, needs to be in the courtroom. I agree. Uh, uh, a witness or two, uh, even after COVID goes away, I believe, uh, a witness or two could be done via Zoom, especially if it's not uh, an extremely important witness or it's easy to convey that testimony via Zoom. I think it's, it's a tool uh, that, that should continue to be used uh, to prevent a witness from traveling all the way from California to be on the stand for 10 minutes. You know, yeah. I think Zoom is, is a good alternative to, to, to those issues. Right. It can be effective. Um, 
So in our in our cases, we we do use a great deal of technology, and I think that's part of part of trying a lawsuit these days is has to do with with technology. Jurors are used to seeing it. Jurors um, jurors are expecting it in many ways. Um, talk talk to us a little bit about the importance of technology, particularly in a COVID trial. Technology, uh, you know, we tried this entire case using technology. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you meet certain lawyers who will say, well, I, I love, you know, two or three blow ups or, you know, find your best five exhibits and, and, and have something physical to hand to the jury. We didn't have that option in this particular case. Uh, so there's nothing more frustrating than you have a witness on the stand, uh, uh, you're crossing him or her. You have a document that's going to, you know, push your point home, and you know your tech support person knows when I get to this point, highlight this particular section or pull this particular photograph, and and when you get to that point, it's frustrating when uh, that can't be done timely, uh, and in the way it should be done. So you have to have good tech support. You have to practice that with the person. Uh, if you work with that person on a regular basis, and he or she knows you. They know when to pull that document up. Uh, we were very well prepared for that case uh, to know when to pull up a certain document uh, or when to highlight a certain section of a document. But you have to be prepared to do that, especially when you have no other option but to display that document or that photograph on a screen and you cannot hand it to a jury. Right, right. I, I, it was it was crucial in, in that particular case. And um, again, it helps with communication. Uh, it helps to present your case and uh, even just having having uh, the ability and, and the court actually for in our particular case, the court had you saw some of those TVs, the court had TVs and they had monitors. Um, but for whatever reason, they weren't working with our system. So we ended up having right. to bring in our own mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day. And I know that's not possible in every case and right. not possible in every case we try, but um, but but you a lot of court systems of course now are are geared with technology in mind. Uh, we we do think it's important. I think it's vitally important, especially during COVID, and and helps you communicate with your jurors. No doubt, and I, I believe I forgot about that issue. But we, as a matter of course, had those huge televisions just with us, uh, just in case something happened. And uh, Murphy's Law, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And it did, but we were prepared for those contingencies and were able to move forward without much delay. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember how uh, the court did like sidebar? That was very interesting. Uh, you know, usually sidebar counsel comes up, you know, the judge moves to the side uh, and the court and the court reporter comes over and types a question. Uh, here, we had to step out of the courtroom, almost back to the judge's office to a, an area in the hall where we all could stand uh, so that the court reporter could hear what was being said to keep an, an adequate record. Uh, so, you know, you don't want to have a, a lot of sidebars because you have to, everybody has to get up and walk out, out of the courtroom to take care of that issue and then, and then come back in. But we had a few of those and it had to be done that way. Uh, so, you know, this, this judge had uh, everything in place where we were going to do sidebars or certain things. Uh, and so that worked out well for that particular case. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I thought so too. And the reality was there were less sidebars. <laughs> yeah, it, had, it had to be because, you know, if you had a sidebar, it was like a, a, a 10 minute proposition just to get everything ready to do the sidebar because corporate had to get her entire setup to move from where she was to in the back uh, by the judge's office. Yeah, and I, I think that that's important. And, and, there, and I say that jokingly that there were less sidebars, but I will say this during COVID, and I'm gonna talk about this in just a little bit about juror attitudes. Um, I, I think that there is, while we certainly had a very patient judge, I think that you don't wanna waste your juror's time uh, and that's probably true in every case, but 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 now in COVID, with with us with, with people believing and rightly so that that time is precious, um, 
they don't want time wasted. And the last thing we wanted was a juror roll, juror roller that rolling their eyes because, oh my goodness, here they go again. Here they go again. Here they go again. They're wasting my time. Just get on with the evidence. Let's move on. Um, I think that, that, that it's probably a good thing not to have so many sidebars. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if, if you're, you know, sometimes you have to object, sometimes you have to have a sidebar Sure. and to protect the record, you need to do that. But keep in mind, uh, that there are 12 to 14 jurors who are waiting for you and who see what happens and, and you don't want to lose credibility with the jury uh, if they uh, interpret your actions as being trying to delay or prolong something that, that should not take as long. Right. Let me ask this. Um, you know me, I'm, I am I'm usually think everything's going wonderfully it doesn't matter you and i are kind of the same like that whatever comes our way we just kind of deal with it and uh we're going even if it seems bad we're going to think it's really good and uh we always have a kind of a positive outlook and and so with that in mind what would you say even in spite of all those things that we had to go through and all the changes and the difficulties um would you say that there there are any advantages now in terms of trying to try to case now during COVID, the good, you know, if someone shows up for jury trial during COVID, then you know that they have a sincere belief in the system uh, and their role in, in what happens during the trial. So you know uh, that the binary is going to be full of people who understand their civic responsibility uh, and will take that role seriously. On the other end, uh, and we had this happen, we had a particular uh, juror or potential juror who was struck uh, because of, he said he may have been exposed to COVID. Uh, and in that particular situation, we didn't want that particular juror, so, so we didn't mind him being struck, but I was almost certain that he was using COVID as a way to get off that jury. I'm sure. But what happens though, when you have that same situation and it's a juror that you want to keep in the benign, right. what do you do in that situation? So you're forced to, to, to ask the judge not to release that person when you want that particular juror or you want to have the defense or the other side have to use a strike to get rid of that person versus just being let go by the judge. So that's always something you have to you know, keep in mind. Uh, COVID could benefit you in that situation. It could also hurt you in that situation. Yeah, on this on this particular juror, we didn't, we didn't want him, but he, he right. came up and was like, Judge, you know, I really hadn't been feeling good lately. Cough, 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 <laughs> cough, 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 cough. Right. And everybody backs away about right. 30 feet. Right. And, um, and the judge, the judge ex excluded him. I was, you know, one of the things I, I, I wrote down in terms of advantages or, or lessons learned, um, one, uh, patience, patience. Mm -hmm. uh, two, overcoming obstacles and trying to figure out how to overcome those obstacles, how to communicate, how to, how to deal with all the mess that we had to deal with. Um, really focusing and we talked about tech support but the mm -hmm. visual and how important the visual is and making sure in any trial that we're we're focused on really the evidence um sometimes personalities can play a big role in a trial and i, I suspect that they always will but but i think sometimes maybe lawyers are too full of themselves and they think it's all about them and, mm -hmm. and i think covid really helps you make sure you focus on the evidence you have to because obviously you know we, i think we may have cut out a few witnesses we decided you know it'd be nice to have that witness but we don't absolutely need it it will prolong the trial um and remember this there were a few days where a few jurors were late uh and we were always concerned we've been trying this case for a week uh, and now we show up on the Monday following the, the week the trial started and we only have 11 jurors. So we don't know if it's just a regular issue or 
has this person contacted COVID? You know, we're, we're almost to the finish line, but we may not get there because of COVID. So you're always concerned with the loan to trial goals, the more likely it is that you could lose a juror or two because someone was exposed uh, uh, to COVID or caught COVID themselves. And then when that happens, you're likely going to get a mistrial because that person has been around the other juror. So that was always a concern. So in the back of our minds, we're always saying, let's keep this case going. Let's get the next witness. Let's move, let's move, let's move. Let, let's get this case to the jury to get it decided as quickly as possible. Right. And I think that that's probably a good question. By the way, I can't see this bottom question. Um, I think that that's a good point. I, I think that, you know, you've got to decide um, whether it's in the best interest to go ahead and move forward with the trial, whether it's, whether it's in your client's best interest to do that or not to proceed with the trial sooner rather than later. And, you know, there are a lot of issues that go into that, but, but I will say this, and we, right now we, you know, there are hundreds of lawyers here on, on this webinar and in your particular circuit, if your if your judges are concerned about moving forward with trial, I just, I guess I would tell you that when we, we try the case in the, in the, the height of COVID and, um, and it was possible, not only possible, but it was a, it was a really, really good experience. And I, I would just let your trial courts know that these are possible. We can do this. We can, we can overcome this. And look, I hope is uh, just like all of you that, that COVID will, uh, will, will go away and we'll be able to resume our, our normal activities like we, like we did pre COVID. But, but in the, in the meantime, um, you know, going to trial um, is hugely important. It's hugely important for our clients to have a trial date, to keep a trial setting. Um, you know, I've always said deadlines spur action um, and a trial deadline will spur action. Either the case will get resolved uh, one way or the other, either, either by sell settlement or by trial. And we, we've got to make sure that we have that we have trial settings now all that being said um there are probably some sometimes that you you may not want to try a case during a height of covid or during during the middle of covid and um so let me talk a little bit about jurors attitudes one of the things that we, because we we try a lot of lawsuits and have a lot of trial settings, we have we have done a lot of um, research. We've done a ton of research on jurors' attitudes during this particular COVID time, and um, and some things that we need to think about. It's as as plaintiffs' lawyers, um, you know, we're we're looking at jurors and we're looking at at what we think would be a good plaintiffs' jurors, and of course. Defense lawyers are doing the same thing on their case in terms of who who would be favorable for them. And of course, at the end of the day, we never we never get who we want, and defense lawyers never get who they want. It's always a group of people seems to be in in the middle. Um, but juror attitudes right now, in the public at large, I would say that uh, that they are less that it's less favorable. Uh, toward large corporations right now. Just uh, the attitudes uh, that we're seeing, that we've, that we've surveyed, that we've talked about, um, we're seeing less favorable attitudes toward large corporations. Um, we're seeing healthcare professionals, not surprisingly, are well-respected, um, well-respected doctors, nurses, any healthcare professionals are well-respected and as a result, if you've got um, if you've got some some witnesses that that are health professionals and they are against you, you need to know that and you need to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, third, people are generally um, more cautious these days because of COVID. They 
They want to know they want to know the dangers and they want to know how to avoid those dangers. And if and if they if somebody doesn't give them that information, it's very upsetting to, to people right now. They just want to know, give me the information and I'll decide what the risk is and, and how far I'm willing to go. But but that's an attitude that we need um, to be aware of. But most importantly, um, showing up for jury duty right now is more up in the air than ever. Um, and that's particularly true in Montgomery. Um, but some of the research that, that we've done have found they're, they're of the group that we talked to over 50% said, I'm just not showing up at all. I mean, I'm not even, I'm going to get a jury summons. I'm going to call and say, look, I'm worried about COVID. I am just, I'm not going to even, I'm not going to even show up. Uh, and, and another 28% said, I'm willing to go, but if the courtroom doesn't have safety measures in place, then I'm not going. And so you're looking at, at almost at more than 75% of the jury group, even if you've got as a plaintiff's lawyer, an attitude in the general public that is, that is, um, that is not favorable toward larger corporations, even though you might have that, your jurors may are going to consist potentially of a, a smaller group of people who may be um, less inclined to your position these days. So that's that balancing act, you know, um, I think sometimes, what if it wasn't a dram shop case that we had? What if it was a product liability seatbelt case? Would we have made the same decision to proceed the trial with that case versus a dram shop case? Uh, because even if you're in what you consider to be a favorable venue, because of the effect of COVID and how, how it influences who shows up uh, for jury selection that day, you may not be in a favorable jury, uh, venue anymore because of who shows up or who does not show up for jury selection. Uh, so trial dates in our firm, we push them. Let's get a trial date, let's go to trial. Uh, but in another situation, it may be, you know what? Let's wait because we wanna make sure this is a close call case. We wanna make sure we have our normal, whatever count that is, turnout uh, that we're gonna need for this particular case. So you have to balance your client's interest of moving forward now versus moving forward with what may not be the jury that you expected. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, and I'd say this, those, a lot of times, and, and I guess we, we're just gonna have to take it case by case, but those who are fearful of COVID are, are getting excused and, um, some of those could be your best jurors. They, they could be. I mean, you know, re remember afterwards uh, for the case we had in Mobile, we talked to the jury afterwards and, and they gave a, a very nice verdict uh, to our client, but they were asking us if we felt like they had given enough. Right, right. They wanted to know had they made a difference. And, and one of the things that Cole emphasized in his closing was uh, you are empowered to make a difference. Uh, you're here, this is what's happening in your community, you can affect what happened, what happens going forward. And I think they took that to heart and they, they even asked us, do you think we did enough? Um, and uh, that was a very, a very good question to have after you've had a, a trial like that and inverted like that and to know that the jury was concerned with helping their community do better by keeping drunk drivers off the road. Yeah. I agree. And I think that, that we've got to, to, um, to be diligent in encouraging people to go to serve. Yes. Um, we've got to ask judges to not let prospective jurors be given easy exits um, from jury service and um we got to get some trial dates and we got to go try some cases we got to i mean you know we like like i said earlier we have to continue to push forward uh you know in some jurisdictions in some counties some venues 
there have been no trials. And so whenever you get started back, whenever that may be, it's going to be a backlog that's just too much to overcome. So at least in places like Mobile County that we know have tried cases, uh, we may try a case in Gwinnett County next month uh, and push forward. You gotta still push forward because if you don't, then there's gonna be a backlog that's gonna affect uh, uh, our jury system for years to come. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, let me do this. If you've got a question, uh, this would be probably a good time to to submit a question, uh, there have been a, been a number of questions asking about a handout. I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, if we're, I don't think there's a handout. Is that right? There isn't a handout. And I don't know if there's got to be a handout. If there's got to be a handout for you to get CLA approval, we'll make sure that we send you one. If, if you would like the photographs of the courtroom to show to another judge where you are, say, look, this can be done that way. Uh, let us know and we will get the, the photographs that we took of that courtroom to you. Yeah. Um, someone asked if if an attorney is engaged in a trial um, and then is exposed somewhere to COVID during the trial, can he participate in trial via telephone or internet live feed? Um, here's, here's what I'd say to that is if if he or she is the the only lawyer, I suspect that a court is going to continue that trial. Um, if there are, if there's more than one lawyer that is that is involved in the case, then then I and the and your client is okay with you participating remotely, um, then I think a court will be okay with you participating remotely. I don't think there's anything um, significant about that um, in general. But if you're the only trial, if you're the only trial lawyer and you you're exposed to COVID and you let the court know you're exposed to COVID, then the likelihood is your trial's going your trial's going to have to yeah. be continued. That's a that's a much bigger issue having an attorney participate via Zoom uh, versus having a witness or two testify via Zoom. That's a, that's a whole different ball game that I think COVID's right. Given that scenario, uh, you probably headed towards a continuous. Uh, yeah. Someone asked, um, talking about criminal trials, do you think using trials by Zoom would violate any confrontation clauses later on down the road? Uh, crim criminal trials, Kendall and I don't do any of those. Uh, I don't know that I can, I have, a, I have an answer. I don't know if I should give it since I don't practice criminal law criminal law, um, there, there are so many, right, there are so many constitutional issues as it relates to criminal cases, and particularly um, trying a case um, in, this, in this particular instance um, with COVID, I don't think they've been answered yet. And it's, um, I mean, obviously, the biggest question we've got in criminal trials right now is the right to a speedy trial, and and nobody's getting those. And so, what happens? All those things are going to have to go through the appellate courts. I'm sorry, I can't do a better job of answering that question. Do you have anything else? I know you. Well, remember, Judge Pipes had tried a criminal case before we tried our civil case. That's right. And one of the things he pointed out was, for a civil case, you there is no requirement that. Uh, have public access but in a criminal case there is so he had to have a corresponding courtroom uh he, he wanted to limit the amount of people in, in the courtroom so for a criminal trial he had to have a closed circuit television in the next door courtroom for anyone in the public who wanted to view the trial in our trial if you were not an attorney a witness or a juror you were not coming into his courtroom uh, but you can't make that same uh restriction in, in a criminal case so there are additional concerns for criminal trials and uh, beyond speaking to what Judge Pipes did in that particular situation, I can't comment beyond that. Right. Uh, someone asked, and it's a, it's a good question and I've, I've got a response, but someone asked, um, don't you, are you basically, are you concerned about jurors pushing back by if a judge doesn't, if someone says I'm concerned about COVID, judge doesn't release, uh, release them, are you concerned about jurors pushing back. Um, my answer to that is that 
yes, there is a concern, but um, I'd rather the juror be there at the end of the day. The, the juror pushed, the juror, who's the juror? The juror is primarily going to push back, I guess, against the court. I don't think the juror is necessarily going to push back against the, the lawyers themselves. They're not going to hear that particular argument as to why the juror should stay. Uh, if anything, the pushback is going to get, be against the, the court. And my job as a lawyer is then to transfer that anger, right, to my case. Um, my, my job as a lawyer is to make sure that that jury is focused upon the um, upon my case and what's going on in my case. And I'll, I'll take that risk any day. Yeah. And it, it's, it's like any other juror selection before COVID. Someone stands up and says, you know, they give an excuse and, and whatever the excuse is, you know, the real reason is they don't want to be there. Okay. So whether it's for COVID or a different reason, if they don't want to be there, is that a, a, a juror that you use a strike on? Or if you know the perception is from the other side that, this is someone who would be favorable to my client's case. You make them use a peremptory strike versus having that juror dismissed outright by the court. So there's there's an advantage to having that person stay there uh, to either be on the jury or make the other side use a peremptory strike. Right. Um, have you seen any instances where defense lawyers attempt to use the COVID situation to gain a tactical advantage at trial? The answer is yes. Um, Mainly what I've seen is just the continuation of case um, based upon a COVID excuse over and over again. In terms of, in terms of trials, I have not necessarily seen that. Uh, but again, I've only tried a, a few cases during COVID. Um, but during trial, I haven't seen it. The primary way I've seen it is just the, the moving of the cases right. on down the line. To avoid a trial in the first place. Right. 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 You agree? I agree. I, I'm dealing with that right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yes, uh, uh, we, we have a situation where uh, COVID uh, has been used multiple times uh, to attempt to obtain a continuance. And more often than not, uh, it has been successful. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever dealt with an adverse witness via Zoom? Um, not during trial, I haven't. Not I have, trial. obviously, during depositions and getting cases ready for trial. We've done, I mean, we're taking a lot of adverse witnesses, adverse experts via Zoom these days. I find it very easy. You have to be, you got to be uh, prepared earlier and you send documents and, and you get it all done. But I, I don't, I mean, I still fly more than I should, but um, but I don't miss flying as much as I used to fly. Right, right. And so I, I this week or well, last week, uh, I deposed two witnesses in Germany via Zoom uh, and uh, the documents were not in dispute. So I sent the documents ahead uh, with uh, that witnesses counsel. So there was no issue there uh, with having the documents ready. As always, there's always an exhibit that you didn't expect the need to use and you had to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would just stand up and place that document in front of the screen and let the witness see it. Then I would cross him or her on it. So there are ways around it. And, and let me say this, before you have to take a witness at trial, adverse or on direct via Zoom, do an in-deposition first. You need to have that practice of knowing how to pull up a document, how to manipulate that document, highlight where you need to uh, is much better than to make a mistake during a deposition to make one at trial in front of a jury. Yeah. Okay. Do you foresee COVID changing the way trials are conducted for the foreseeable future? That is uh, exhibits displayed electronically as opposed to being directly interacted with by the jury. The answer is yes, I do. Uh, in a couple of ways. The, the first way is <clears throat> I've become more um, more engaged and gained more knowledge about jurors' attitudes um, during COVID than I did pre-COVID. Um, I, I, again, some of the stuff that I've shared with you today, I wouldn't have cared about, uh, but, but now I do care about. And so in terms of gathering juror information and gathering um, what potential jury venaries are thinking or doing, I'm much more inclined to do that now. In terms of jury presentation, yes, I think it also changes. Again, 
and we've talked about it today, is I think um, the way technology interacts with jury, we've had to be more on top of that uh, than we were previously. And I think that that will continue onward, even, even if um, these issues go away. I agree with that. And, and even before COVID, we've always tried to use technology to present evidence. And so it's just a continuation of what we were doing. So it's not that difficult a, a jump. If you're someone who did not use technology at all and now need to use technology, hire somebody to be in trial with you. Don't try to do it on your own because there's nothing more frustrating uh, than when you're trying to present evidence and you have an issue that you can't control. So hire somebody. Someone's asking about uh, some of the studies and I'll, I'll give some of that um, just verbally. I'm not, I'm not gonna share our work product, but I'll give verbally what I, what I know and what I've discovered uh, by dealing with, with folks who do this for a living. Um, but someone asked specifically about demographics of the jurors who were not showing up. That's changed a little bit early on. It was elderly who were not showing up. That is that has changed as they have become vaccinated. As, as you can imagine, those who are older feel a civic engagement and responsibility to show up. And so we're seeing that has has changed. Um, uh, most of that, most of the ages that really don't want to show up are uh, those in their 30s and 40s um, in terms of those economic status. Uh, not surprisingly, a lot of, of working people, um, and, and it really gets back to some working people just can't afford to miss work, right? And so they use COVID as a, as a potential. And, and you know, not to get too overly political here, but, um, and I'm not getting political, but just what some of what, what we showed is that um, pro-Trump voters uh, seem to appear for, for jury duty, where those who are more anti-Trump don't appear for jury duty. So hope that information helps. Um, were there any challenges unique to dram shop cases that you encountered in trying a case during COVID? I, I didn't think so. As a matter of fact, I, I thought the fact that it was a dram shop case allowed us to proceed uh, because we felt like, you know what, no matter who shows up for a dram shop case, you know, we may take the first 12 who walks, who walks in simply because of the facts of that particular case. So I, I, I felt like the dram shop case made it easier for us to proceed. Yeah, I agree. Um, what steps are you taking to ensure that Zoom depositions are being conducted fairly? I saw that. That's a very good question. There's some, sometimes you can't control that. You, you want to make sure uh, that when you start on a, on a line of questioning that's important, make sure it's after a break so there's no need to for someone to ask for a break if you've been going for an hour and it's about time for a break don't start an important line of questioning because a break is, is appropriate at that time and then something could happen so the timing of your questions is important uh and also you know you can see everybody in the room if you want to in a zoom deposition so just expand that camera so that you're not just looking at the witness but you're also looking at the witness and everybody else in the room. And I think that that may help as well. Yeah, and I've also seen, and I don't have it in front of me, but that's, again, a great question. I've also seen um, a checklist that a lawyer will read and say, as lawyers in this deposition, we agree to abide by A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And that's read, um, if anyone disagrees with this, then speak up now. Um, and so that's used, a lawyer will typically read that early on, uh, really to address your primary concern, and that is coaching uh, a witness. Right, and I've, I've seen it in the Zoom perspective and also a regular deposition. Every time when someone comes in from a break, somebody asks a question. Did you talk to anybody about the case while we were on that break? And have that person answer that question every time, if that's a route you think you need to follow. Yeah. Well, sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions. Our time is up. Um, 
If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to Kendall and me. Um, my email address is cole.portis at Beasley Allen, and it's kendall.dunson at Beasley Allen. Again, we'll be back at the third, the third Wednesday of next month, and we'll talk about um, how to turn a workers' compensation case into a product liability case. Thank you all so much for participating. See you later. Thank you.